fellowship of imperfect people who decided to to really have a relationship with our perfect God. It helped us grow by learning from each other's experiences and uh, by encouraging one another and uplifting each other. We are happy to be a part of a small group because we get to know more people, we get to know each other intimately. Some of us are thousands of miles away from our families. Others have no families at all. But being part of a small group gives you an extended family. Over three years ago, we were looking for a church that will help us to grow spiritually. And by God's grace, God led us to CCF and actively joined uh, the small group. It improves our attitudes when you have godly people who praise for you and truly care about your life. Accountability. Um, it helps us check one another, uh, have a support to each other as we grow in that Christ likeness. It helps us to uh, experience and extend the love of Christ. When I was two years old, my mother left the Philippines to work abroad. I was grateful for the sacrifices she made for our family, but not having her around was difficult. I grew up seeing my father cheat on my mom while she was away, and I swore to myself that I would never become like him. On the rare occasions that my mom was home, she tried to raise me as a Christian. She sent me to a Christian school, made me serve in church and participate in other religious activities. I knew that Jesus died on the cross for me, but this was all just in my head. Without a personal relationship with Jesus, I fell into a lifestyle of sin. I proudly indulged in vices and immoral relationships. I was so caught up in my need for affection and recognition that cheating on girlfriends was normal for me. And I would often treat my friends to alcohol and other vices to gain their approval. My desire to show off financially became such a big part of my life that I started doing whatever it took to earn more money. At work, I made many compromises, fake sales and stole company products to hit my quotas and make money on the side. In my mind, I believed that everything I was doing was okay because all I had to do was ask God to forgive me later. What was important to me was finding my lifestyle and pleasing my friends and girlfriend, even if my decisions took a huge toll on my family and ended up causing a rift between me and my mom. In 2015, I was invited to participate in a youth conference by my girlfriend at the time. I enjoyed myself and started attending CCF. I attended Sunday services and served in a ministry, but still my sinful lifestyle of cheating, stealing, and immorality continued. In early 2017, my life started to crumble. My compromises at work were discovered, and the company launched an administrative case against me that required me to pay nearly seven figures in damages. My girlfriend discovered that I had cheated on her, and our relationships continued to be on the rocks. 
I found myself crying out to God. I completely surrendered my life to Christ. What I knew in my head about His saving grace moved from my head and filled my heart. While I prayed for a solution to my problems, I decided to take a leap of faith and apply for a job opening at CCF. I said, God, if this is where you want me to be, please make a way for me to get a job here quickly. In just a few weeks, I was hired for a position in CCF Beyond as the International Church Planning Communications Coordinator. However, God clearly was not done with me yet. After months of trying and failing to keep my relationship with my girlfriend pure, it became clear that it wasn't working. We finally broke up, and the Lord took away the last piece of my past life. It was then that I truly understood what it meant to be broken. Meanwhile, God gave me the unique opportunity and privilege to be intentionally discipled and mentored by several pastors, all of, all of whom helped me to a joyful slave of Jesus Christ with Him as the Lord of my life. I experienced God's grace in amazing ways. First, the case was brought against me by my previous employer, was suddenly closed, and my debt was forgiven completely. Later on, I was able to reconnect with my family and to apologize to them, especially my mom. As my disciples continued to mentor me, God gave me the chance to pay it forward, discipling others as well. Over the pandemic, God allowed my family who are abroad and in the Philippines to gather and have our first fam family Bible study. We were able to ask each other for forgiveness, get to know each other more, and I was able to intentionally reach out to them and disciple them, especially my nephews. As I continue to work with CCF Beyond, God has also granted me the privilege to connect with people abroad, to help plant churches and form new D-groups in locations like Illinois, Taiwan, South Korea, Houston, Kuwait, and Florida. Locally, God has also given me the blessing of leading my own growing group of men and serving in the big singles ministry. Another blessing is that I am about to get married to my fiance, Meg Mendoza. There are no words to express how grateful I am to my great and powerful God for how He allowed me, a sinner, cheater, and thief, to be redeemed and to serve Him in ministry. I am not perfect and I still have my struggles, but God is faithful and it is His love and Lordship in my life that strengthens me to strive to be more like Christ and practice moment by moment obedience. I am Hakem Monte, once a slave to money and influence, now redeemed and renewed in Christ. To God be all the glory. Praise God. Indeed, uh, God is still in the business of changing lives. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing today? Good? Great? We're glad that you are here this afternoon, spending your time with us, worshiping our King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Can you turn to your neighbor and tell them, I praise God that you are here today? Okay, with a smile, of course. All right, so... Welcome to CCF or Christ Commission Fellowship. If you are here for the first time, let me know where are you seated, okay? Any first-timer on this side? First-timers here. Oh, there you go. Welcome, sister. And then how about this row? Do we have first-timers over here? How about here? Do we have first-timers? This side, first-timers. First-timers, we have one over there. Praise God. Okay, up there, do we have any first timer up there? First timers? All right, so if you're here for the first time, uh, please don't forget to fill out the form. I believe you, you receive a printed form, or you could also scan the QR code if you're a ticky guy, okay? If you like uh, technology, you could uh, fill out the form online by scanning that QR code. Or if you just, just like to write down, please uh, do have the first timer sheet, okay? And of course, we would love to, to connect with you, not only for this Sunday, but for the days, Sundays to come, for the weeks to come, for the months to come, for the years to come. And we would like you to grow with us in your walk with God. And how we do that, our, our growth towards Christ-like maturity, we do that in small group settings or setup. That's why we have 
different small groups, or we call that here D group or discipleship group. Okay, so we encourage everyone to be part of a D group. We have D groups all over the place, all over the city. Okay, we also have for the singles, we call it B1 with God ministry. We also have for the youth or the elevate ministry. So all ages are covered. We also have golden ladies and in the future, the golden boys. All right. So all ages are covered for our D group. All right. So if you don't have a D group yet, please join one. I really or we are really encouraging you because here in CCF, that is our main ministry. Okay. And of course, we do have more announcement. Uh, as you grow in your walk with God through the small group setup, we, we pray that it will overflow. And then depending on your giftings, you serve also in one of our ministries, our different ministries here. And one of that is the next gen ministry. We call it uh, next gen or next generation for the uh, children's ministry. Okay, if you want to be a life shaper for the next generation, please do approach uh, Brother James and Sister Wang De Kila. They are our coordinators for the next gen ministry or the kids ministry. And I think, uh, Exalt, you're still looking for more volunteers, right? For the production team, they are still more lo- looking for more volunteers. So if you, is still, audition is still ongoing, right? For special aud- auditions to those who would like to, to catch up for auditions. If you are gifted, all right, in uh, musical instruments, uh, singing, uh, using or, or, or operating the equipment, cameras, mixers, uh, audio, audio mixers, computers, pro presenter, anything about that, uh, please do approach our Exalt team, uh, uh, Brother Chucks or Pastor Chucks. You can uh, just go straight to him, okay? And of course, we also have sports ministry here in CCF. Okay? We don't only uh, grow in our walk with God, become, become spiritually shaped, but we also want all of us to be physically shaped, in shape, okay? That's why we have sports ministry and our schedules for the upcoming uh, weeks. It's going to be all basketball, right? It's all basketball. So next, it's going to be every Wednesday. We, we play basketball uh, at 85251 Street Northwest. Okay, that's going to be uh, close to, to downtown. So if you are here, uh, a sports lover, okay, and in the future, we will also, if we can look for a uh, bigger, bigger facility, right, we also have uh, badminton and, and volleyball. All right, we will rotate it, not, not only basketball every Wednesday. It's just so happened that, that the, the facility that we were able to book is a smaller one. We, we cannot accommodate volleyball and badminton at this moment. But basketball, of course, we welcome uh, those who would like to play with us, okay, every Wednesday. Okay, uh, still, okay, today is going to be our, our first Sunday. We will have our fellowship. So later on, after worship service, please uh, don't uh, go home right away. We will have our our snacks and our fellowship and tea chat uh, together, okay? And just, okay, no more announcement, but uh, just to give you a heads up, uh, Christmas is fast approaching, all right? So we also have Christmas parties, right? So, but this time we will do it as a whole, as, as, as a church. And that's going to be here, okay, at the foyer. That's going to be on December 9, all right, am I right? December 9, it's going to be Saturday. So please book off your December 9, Saturday afternoon. That's going to be 2 o'clock to 6 p.m., 7 p.m., 8 p.m., okay? So that's going to be at the foyer. So please book off your calendar December 9 at, in the afternoon until evening. So we will celebrate uh, Christmas uh, all together. Uh, usually we do it by area, but this time, uh, because of the demand, okay, <laughs> so that we could really know each other uh, and, and celebrate together on December, so we will do it as a whole, as a church, okay? Is that okay with you? All right, okay, no more announcement, okay. So once again, welcome uh, everyone, all, all, also to those of you who are joining us online, wherever you are, we also welcome you. Please uh, do give us a shout out and send us a message to our Facebook Messenger if you would love to connect with us. If you are a first-timer watching us or joining us online and you want to be part of a, an online D-group, we also have online D-groups, so please do connect with us, and we would love also to, to uh, connect you to our online D-groups. Alrighty. Okay, enough for announcements. We will continue with our series today. What's our series? 
winning the war within. And for the benefit of those of you who are just here for the first time or second or third time, we are in the series of the book of Romans. And this book is uh, quite a long uh, a book. And that's why here in, in this series, we, we divided that into five seasons or five segments. And at this very moment, we are already on the third season. And last week, uh, Pastor Chucks opened the third season, this winning the war within on the book of Romans chapter six. And today we will continue on the second half of chapter six and the first half of chapter seven. Are you excited to, to learn from God's revelation from the book of Romans of, of how we're gonna walk our lives victoriously as Christians? Are you excited? All right, why won't we bow on our heads and let's spend time uh, this to, to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you, God, for allowing us to gather once again this wonderful day, this beautiful day, the day that you have made, O oh God, and we rejoice in it, O oh Lord. Lord, we praise you. We magnify you because you are our God, our Abba Father, that is so, so much loving, O oh God. You have bestowed upon us, Lord, your extravagant love, your lavish love, O oh God. And a while ago, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Indeed, Father, we praise you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, for dying on the cross for all of our sins, and we were forgiven, oh God. And Lord, we, we, as, as, as what your word has said, oh God, it's a privilege for us to be called your children. What great love that you have for us, oh God, because you have called us your children. And as your children, Father, we are here today worshiping you, oh God, serving you and serving our brethren, oh Lord. And as we come to worship you by, by listening to your word today, Lord, may you open our hearts and our minds, oh God, as you reveal yourself to us, Father. Lord, give us an understanding through your Holy Spirit, oh God, so that we will embrace the truth that you are about to reveal. And Lord, not only we will embrace, but we will do something about it, oh God. We will apply this in our everyday lives, oh God, so that we will live a victorious Christian life, oh Lord. Lord, bless each and every one of us, bless the people, even for those who are joining us online, wherever they are, Father. I pray that all of us, Lord, will really be a committed followers of Christ. Even I pray for myself, as you, myself, O oh God, as you, you, you speak through me, I pray, O oh Lord, that your words alone, O oh God, will be uh, spoken from your mouth, O oh Lord, and that is only for your glory alone. And all these things we ask in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen and amen. So we will continue with our series in the book of Romans, and now we are here on the segment of sanctification. Just a quick review, okay? So we, we, we talk about the problem of human being. What's the problem? Sin, and all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's, that's, uh, that's why we need salvation. And, and we also in the second segment, we talk about uh, the, the solution that God has given through His Son, Jesus Christ, the righteousness imputed in us, justification by faith. You cannot be declared not guilty by our own selves, but it is only through Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us. That is the way for salvation. And here in the third segment, as we continue to walk through in this, into this sanctification, okay, this is about being more conformed into the image of God, into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ, and knowing that if God hates sin and we conform and we want to be more like him, what are we going to do? We too should have the mindset that we hate sin and we need to deal with sin properly. And that is why we, t we are talking about righteousness empowered, the life of a truly saved person that is the continual sanctification or the process of becoming more and more like Jesus in our characters, in our attitudes. And we have learned previously that the phases of salvation, the, the justification part that we have been saved from, the penalty of our sin. And then in this sanctification, uh, sanctification phase, we are saved from the power of sin. Sin is still here, we are still sinners, okay? But we are no longer slave to that because we have been saved from the power of sin. And then glorification, that will happen one day when we will be with God in heaven we will be saved forever from the presence of sin. And here we are still in this sanctification uh, uh, segment, 
And last week, Pastor Chokes uh, opened that one and, 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 and uh, shared to us that we need to know something from the truth of God so that we will overcome the power of sin who is still present in this life here on earth. Are you ready to listen to the word of God? Okay. So who among you here have watched this movie, late 90s? Okay, I mean in. Okay, because it will reveal your age. All right, so I watched this movie while I was still in university, college days, maybe late 90s. Okay, this is the, the Amistad. Okay, you know the story. If you have watched this movie, it's about slavery. Okay, you know, there are slaves. There were slaves that uh, were, were in, inside a ship called Amistad. Okay, they were sailing from Cuba to, to America. This is true to life story. Okay, and, and during that long trip, there was one guy there, uh, one slave that he led the, the unpre- unprecedented uprising against those uh, people who, who enslaved them. So that's the story. Now, my point is, slavery, okay? Slavery has been around since the time when the Egyptians enslaved the Jews for 400 years. Slavery, it has been all over the world, worldwide, okay? It's, it has been practiced in Africa, in America, in Europe, even in Asia, okay? Slavery is normal. Now, to think that there was a time in history when one man could hold another captive in a master-slave relationship in most disgraceful way. It exists, okay, in some parts of the world, even up today. That's the reality. So, you know, slavery works, right? Slaves were, were treated like animals. We, ha- we have seen that in the movie, re- re- uh, True to Life story movies, okay? They were beaten, starved, cursed, separated from their families, okay? Used to, to do ima- unimaginable hard labor, okay, under the most harsh conditions. Now, they were not paid, okay, because they were slaves. They were not given decent living conditions. You know what? In America, during the American Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln made an official proclamation to end slavery in the United States. And this is the Emancipation Proclamation. It happened on January 1st, 1863. What happens there? Slaves were now free to leave the plantations and make their own way of life. They were set free, okay? The legal power that slave owners once had to control the lives of the other people was finally broken during this emancipation proclamation. You know, newspapers during that time, North and South, okay, virtually scream the headlines, abolishing slavery, all right? You know what? Even with that emancipation proclamation, a strange thing happened. What was that? Many of slaves never left their masters, okay? They continued serving their cruel old masters until they died. Sad to say. Why? You know what? When they were asked why they thought about President, what they thought about President Lincoln's abolishing slavery, okay? You know what? What was the response? They replied, they don't know who is President Lincoln, and they don't know what is Emancipation Proclamation. That's why they continue to serve their old masters, okay? Since those slaves were ignorant of their freedom, they continued serving as abused and beaten slaves in the fields. Folks, there is a powerful similarity between that fact of history and the spiritual truth which the Apostle Paul reveals to us in the second half of Romans chapter 6. And our topic for today is true freedom, know your new master. Folks, don't be ignorant. Let's know who our master is. Okay, we need to know that in Christ, there is freedom. And the key principle behind experiencing true freedom is recognizing who our master is. Okay, hence the principle that we are about to talk today. To experience true freedom, Jesus Christ must be the master and Lord of our lives. And why do I emphasize this one? Because, because for most people, they think of Jesus as savior of their souls from hell, 
but not Lord, not master. Okay, it's like making, making Jesus as the fire insurance. Okay, I, I want to get rid of hell. That's why I, will, I want Jesus to be my savior. You said it's so cool, okay? Fire insurance, but they don't want Jesus to be their master, their boss. You know, if you, you have a master, you will follow whatever your master will say, your boss will say, right? But many people today don't want Jesus to be their master. Folks, you will never experience genuine freedom until Jesus becomes your true master and the Lord of your life. My question is, would you like to experience true freedom in your life? Would you? True freedom. Okay, so our passage from Romans tells us how that happens. So our outline for today is from from chapter 6, verses 16 to 23. We will talk about freed from sin bonded to Christ, and in the chapter 7, verses 1 to 13, it's about release from the law and join to Christ, okay? So we will learn those things as we go through the second half of chapter 6 of Romans and the first half of Romans chapter 7. This is where we left off last Sunday, chapter, uh, verse 15 of, of Romans 6, and it says here, what then? This is Apostle Paul talking to the Christians in, the, in Rome, both Jews and Gentiles, What then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be, okay? What Apostle Paul is saying here, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning, okay? We know salvation is is by grace through faith. We all know that one. We are justified or we were declared not guilty. The righteousness of, of, of Christ has been imputed to us by faith and not by obeying the law. We have learned that from the previous messages. Now, now that we are saved and forgiven, can we do whatever we want? Because we are saved anyway. That's what the, the Apostle Paul was asking. But he said, may it never be. Of course not. All right? The sad reality is that many Christians are still living in slavery to their old master. Who is that master? Satan. Okay? If he can keep you from being ignorant, Satan, okay? He can keep you imprisoned and enslaved in the bondage of sin away from God. That's his strategy. That may be where some of you are today, okay? Maybe some of you today, we live our lives defeated, discouraged, and doing what Satan wants us to do instead of doing what God wants us to do. You're still bowing down to your former master of sin and miserable as a result. You have a miserable life, even if you call yourself Christian. Now, the Apostle Paul wants you to know that you have been emancipated, freed, set free, and you can enjoy victory over sin in your daily living. You know, Dr. Uh, Sean McDowell said, true freedom it's not a matter of doing what you want without restraint, but cultivating the right wants and living in obedience to God's will. In other words, freedom results when our wants align with, what, with God's will, with what God wants us to do. Now, Satan's most effective tool is to make people think they are free when in fact they are bound and are his slaves. And the truth is, we have been set free from sin and we are bonded to Christ. That is why Apostle Paul uh, said in, in, in verse 16, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. Now here, you see the word present. I colored it differently. And later on, you will see more of that word present. If you go back to the previous chapter that Pastor Chucks uh, shared to us last Sunday, you can read the word present twice in verse 13, okay? And this word present here, it means from original word, Greek, uh, parastemi, okay, to place a person or thing at one's disposal to bring into one's fellowship or intimacy, okay? Present yourself, meaning to put yourself at someone's disposal to give in to the ways of another. Imagine that you give in to the ways of another. Let's say, for example, if you are, you are playing with your friends and where your friends want to do something, do this, do this, I don't do that, no, do this, and then you will, finally you will give in. 
okay, I will do what you want. That is, you present yourself. You give in, you give in to the ways of another, someone. And Paul is saying here, you present your, when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey. So again, we will talk about slavery here, and you will encounter more a lot of these words in the coming verses, the word slaves, okay? So Paul uses the term slave to describe a person under a complete control of someone or something. And here, Apostle Paul is saying, you might be slave of either, okay? Either of sin or either slave of obedience. Now, prior to faith in Christ and baptism, believers were enslaved to sin and suffered in, in its effects separation from God, eternal separation from God. Now, Paul presents salvation as deliverance from spiritual bondage. We have learned that, okay? And here he illustrates, he illustrates this one as a transfer from one master to another from sin to God. Now, when we pursue sinful pleasure, we believe we are experiencing freedom. That's what we are thinking. But when, in fact, we are entering into a slavery to sin. That's why Jesus says in John 8, 34, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. Now, most of us don't like that, this verse, okay? We think we can sin a little here and there without becoming slaves of sin. But it's very clear that if we commit on sinning, meaning deliberately sinning, that is your way of life, you are a slave to sin. Now, what happens when you tell that, that one, just one little lie, one little lie, okay? And then in the coming days, it will, it will become more it will become easier and easier to tell a lie. Do you agree with me? A small lie today, a small lie tomorrow, and then you will just wake up one day, this is my lifestyle, lying, right? Or maybe sometimes what happens when we let our anger get out of control, it stirs up our anger in the people around us, and so we, we get even angrier, all right, to prove our point. And every time we do it, it gets a little easier and easier until hostility and anger have us in their grip. Okay, that's what sin does, according to God's word. Slowly but surely, it will have a grip on you, and you will become slaves to sin. Now, the question is, why do many Christians today, professing Christians, but they keep on sinning deliberately? Why do you think so? Well, for some people, they will say, they will say to themselves, I am already forgiven of my sins, okay? It's okay, I'm already forgiven. I am saved, so it's okay. That's what Apostle Paul was saying. Do we continue in sinning so that grace may abound? If that is your attitude about sin, you are abusing the grace of God and submitting yourself to Satan. Now, well, many people will say, Christians will say, they reason to themselves that no one is getting hurt because of my sin. I'm not causing any hurt to somebody, all right? If I do this, it's okay. Everyone is doing this. But you know what? The truth is, no one is getting hurt, okay? If you're lying, no one is getting hurt. You know what? Jesus and the Holy Spirit is grieved every time we sin. So Jesus himself and the Holy Spirit is grieved if we sin. They are hurt. And the Bible says we are all slaves. Either sin, slave to sin, our slave to obedience. The question is, whose slave are you? Satan or Christ? Okay, look at your neighbor. Ask them, whose slave are you? Okay. But for the husband, don't say, I am a slave of yours to your wife, okay? <laughs> we are not slaves to our wives, all right? Now, Colossians chapter 3, if you look at the Bible, you know, uh, uh, it was described there that the wrath of God is coming upon to those who are sons of disobedience. It was described, the sons of disobedience to those who are slaves of Satan, okay? And the Bible is saying, we were once slaves of disobedience, okay? Let's continue. Verse 17, Paul continued, but thanks be to God 
that, that though you were slave to sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Now, Paul continues to talk about slavery here, okay? Contrasting reality between being slave to sin and being slave to Christ. So he was illustrating a contrast here, slave to sin and slave to, to righteousness or slave to Christ. Now, if you can uh, take a look at here, if you observe uh, the word uh, God, what can you learn about God? God freed us from sin. It is God who freed us from sin. He initiated the biggest problem of human being. It's our problem. But God himself made a solution because of his great love, because of his holiness, his wrath, that we cannot withstand. There's no way we could withstand the wrath of God apart from his solution. He set us free from sin. And now here, Paul says, but thanks be to God, though you were slaves of sin. In other words, he was rejoicing with his audience here that he can now speak in the past tense. So it says here, you were slaves of sin. Past tense. I know that for most of you here, that is also true. Of course, all of us were slaves to sin at, at some point in our lives, and that is true to us. All right? Now, if you have trusted Christ as your Savior, and Lord, and believe in Him, you have already decided for yourself that who should your master be? That Jesus Christ will be your master. Okay? And verse 18, Paul said, and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. We are now free from the power of sin through Jesus Christ. It does not mean that we will... We will uh, never sin again because we are still here. In the, the, the sin is still present, okay? But the presence of, si of, of sin has no longer power over us. We have been freed from the power of sin over us. Why? Because there is a great power in us. And who is that? The Holy Spirit who is in you, the Holy Spirit who is in me, so that we do not need to give in to every temptation that Satan is presenting us. We have the power inside us. This is, folks, this is supernatural. We cannot do it on ourselves, on our own strength. It is through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is why being filled with the Holy Spirit, giving in or yielding to the power of the Holy Spirit is a spiritual discipline that we, that you and I should always have every day, every moment of our lives because the truth is we are still in the flesh. And there's a, a, a great tendency that we will give in to our flesh, to our sinful nature. So it's a discipline to let the Holy Spirit control you. Why? Because we have a new master in Jesus Christ. We are willing slaves who want to live righteous lives for his glory. That's why Apostle Paul said in Galatians 5.1, it was for freedom, meaning we have been set free from the sin. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Paul is saying here, God set us free for total freedom. And because of that action of God through Jesus Christ, what's the solution or what's, what's the command? Do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. You have been set free. How do I picture this one? How do I, I explain this verse in, 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 a, a, in an image? Okay, let's, let's go to this next slide. You know, in the old, old times, when you are in prison, you, don't, you do not only go into the prison cell like, like what we have today. We go to the prison cell, it's very comfortable, you have free food, you can, uh, I don't know here, I haven't, went, I haven't gone to, uh, <laughs> to <laughs> the prison cells, but as I have heard, it's very comfortable. It's, I don't know, if a huge cell, nice facilities, but you know, if you go to the Philippines, like uh, uh, four by four, 10 people, right? <laughs> But you know, if you're inside a cell, nowadays, you don't have chains, right? But during their time, your hands are chained, your feet are chained, you have shackles, you have chain, you have this uh, huge 
heavy metal bowl, all right? That's what it looks like to be imprisoned. But Jesus said, I have, have been set you free because of freedom. He said, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. We have been set free from imprisonment of sin. We are free to go out. And not only that, the chains were broken. The chains from your feet were broken. The chains and shackles from your hands were broken. God in Christ Jesus freed us totally from the guilt and power of sin. Total freedom. Okay? Now the problem is, this is the problem, not only with, with some Christians, but many Christians today. This is the problem. Many Christians today, they don't want to take off the shackles. Yes, they went out of the prison cell, but they don't want to take off the shackles and the chains. They're walking outside free from the, the, the imprisonment of, inside of this, uh, the four corners of imprison, uh, prison cell, but they're walking outside with chains on their own will. Even if, if, it is, if Christ has been, uh, the, the chains were broken by Christ. That's what it, looked like. it looks like. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. Jesus wants us to have total freedom. So don't, do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Take off that shackles, friends. Take off the chains because I have, I have totally uh, uh, led you into total freedom. That is what the Bible is saying. Now, folks, know who your new master is. Again, we were freed from sin, but only to be bound to our new master. That's why Paul continues here. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented, again, you encounter again the word present or presented, your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Here we go. We, 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 we read or we heard the word sanctification. Again, the process of becoming more and more like Jesus. Remember the word present? It is to give in to the ways of another. All right? Now here, Paul was contrasting, presenting yourselves to, to, to sin and presenting yourselves to righteousness. In verse 19, it says here, if you are slave to sin, you are continually presenting your body, the members of your, your body as slaves to impurity and lawless, lawlessness. Lawlessness means here disobedience, okay? Slave to sin. The picture of the life continues in disobedience to the word of God. That's what it, look, it looks like to be slave to sin. On the contrary, slave to righteousness, you are presenting yourself, the members of your body, as slave to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Slave to righteousness, bonded to Christ, all right? Continuous sanctification. There is growth towards Christ-likeness, continuous. You never stop growing in your characters and becoming like the characters of Jesus. Submitting or presenting, giving into the ways fully to a life that is right in the eyes of God. You're continually presenting, okay? Presenting. And then uh, Paul continues, verse 20, when, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin, again, uh, Paul, Paul uh, emphasized the word freed from sin. By who? Who did that? God. And enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in, again, another phrase here, resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. Now, we are never in a neutral zone. We are slaves of something and free from another. It's either or or. It's, it's not uh, uh, both, okay, or none, okay? We are slaves of something. Now, in verse 21, a person who is slave to sin, he is deliberately disobeying God, just waiting for the fulfillment of God's wrath, which is eternal condemnation. 
death. All right? And then in verse, in verse 22, if you are enslaved to God, here a genuine saved person, okay, justified person, justified by faith. If you are saved, you are justified by faith. A genuine saved person will go through sanctification, the progress in Christ-like growth, okay? And we are anticipating perfection in the eternal life to come. We are looking forward one day for that perfection, the glorification that we will be free totally from the presence of sin. But while we are here waiting for that glorious day, we will result in sanctification, the growth to becoming more and more like Jesus. Let me put that this way. So verse 20 to 22, Paul was saying, okay, if you are slave to sin, you are free in regard to righteousness, which the outcome of those things is death. Okay, slave to sin, deliberately sinning, all right? The phrase here, uh, free in regard to righteousness, it means that you wanted to break free from living the life that God wants for you. In your mind, if that is your mindset, you are free. I am free, okay? You know what? There are people today who don't want to follow God because they think that uh, God is KJ, huh? killjoy. You have these rules, do this, do that, do this. I don't like that one. I want to live a free life. For them, that's freedom. That's, that's what, what it means here. You are free in regard to righteousness, but you are slave to sin, okay? On the contrary, those who are slave to righteousness, Apostle Paul was saying, freed from sin, the power of sin, and enslaved to God, resulting in sanctification. This is beautiful picture, free, uh, freed from sin, and then not only freed from sin, you have a new master, you are enslaved to God, leading to sanctification, becoming more and more holy and conforming to the characters of Jesus. Living right before God, you know what, the imparted righteousness of Christ in us, that will result to sanctification, living a life that is holy and pleasing to God. Okay, so folks, we need to recognize our new master. Yes, we were once slave to sin, but now, we are slave to righteousness. Are you? Are you slave to righteousness? Well, ask your neighbor. Are you slave to righteousness? <laughs> All right, amen. And the last verse of Romans chapter 6, for the wages, uh, let's read this all together. This is our memory verse for this week, okay? One, two, three, go. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. All right, so you can share this, this gospel using only this one verse in the Bible, okay? And then this is uh, one of the, uh, the uh, most beautiful uh, verses that we use in, in gospel presentation. Again, just to make sure we understand, you know, the word wage here is something we get, okay? It's something we deserve from our work, wage, salary, okay? And we get in exchange for something we do. Is that right? You, you work for, for, for wage or are you working for just free? Oh, of course, no, all right? You don't work for free nowadays. You have mortgage, all right? You have to, uh, to, to demand wages, or higher wages, okay? So if you, if you have wage, you are working for it, okay? That's what a wage is. Now, wage, in original term, this refers to subsistence pay, like, like allowance for the soldiers to buy food. It's only allowance, the word wage. It's just allowance. Now, when I thought about that, I realized when we pursue a life of what we think is freedom and eventually become a slave of sin, you know what? We are selling ourselves cheaply. It's only allowance, cheap, okay? We sell ourselves so cheaply to sin if we continue on sinning. In tremendous contrast, the gift of God here is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this is so priceless. Eternal life is priceless. It's free to us, free gift to us, but it costs, it costs God a lot because, because it costs the life of Jesus. Okay? So you cannot measure its value because it was purchased not by silver, 
not by gold, okay, but by the precious blood of our new master, Jesus Christ. So what happens? What happens where we are in Christ? We have been freed from sin. We died from our sin, and then we are bonded to Christ. Okay. You know, in the Old Testament, uh, if you read the book of Exodus, Deuteronomy, okay, slaves are set free on the seventh year. But you know what? The, 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 the slaves, they are free to choose who will they, the, their master be after freedom. Okay? You know, there were reasons that, that the, the slaves, uh, uh, three reasons that uh, the, the slaves that time, they will remain slave to their uh, former slave, if, even if they have been set free on the, the seventh year. First reason is they love their master. Okay, they will say, uh, I, 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 will, I, I will choose not to be, be set free from a master because I love him. Okay? The second reason is I love my master's household. In Filipino, we say it, napamahal na ako dito, right? That's in Filipino term. And the third one is he is better off with his master than being his own master of himself. Now, what can we learn from that? If Jesus is our master, do you love Jesus? Do you love him? Do you love those people in the household of Jesus, of God? You're not saying yes. You don't love your neighbor, right? <laughs> do you? So what's our application for that? What should be the mindset of a bond slave of Christ? Ask yourself, what does my master, master want? What will make my master happy? How can I best serve my master and his family? Other questions. So ask yourself, is my life pleasing in the sight of my master? Do I have any sin that I have to let go? Do I have any characters of Jesus that I need to continue on cultivating because I have now the new master? I know who my master is. I'm not ignorant. I know who my master is. All right, so ask, your question, ask yourself with these questions. Let's go to the next part. Release from the law, joined to Christ. Let's go to chapter 7. Paul continued, Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. Okay, so obviously, any law has jurisdiction over us for as long as we are alive. Do you agree with this statement? How will you prosecute a person if the person is dead? How? There's no way. Okay, that's why nowadays uh, it's, it's sad to hear this news. A few weeks ago, we have heard that there's another mass, mass shooting. In, in USA, right? But what happens to these, to these uh, mass shooters? Usually, they commit suicide. And after they, they, they died for, for committing suicide, can you uh, uh, prosecute that person? No, because he's already dead. That's what Apostle Paul was saying here. And he continues, verse 2 to 3. He's making an ana analogy here, okay? Or for the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Here Paul introduces the key concept to his argument uh, in these verses 1 to 6. Only death can terminate the bond between a person and the law. Only death. And in verses 2 to 3 here, Paul illustrates this principle using a marriage, a law on marriage contract analogy. Okay? So the point Paul is making here is that relationship is ended by death. By the way, Paul is not uh, uh, talking about or, or teaching about uh, marriage here. He's just making an analogy. We, we can talk about this on some other passages. But this is an analogy of what will happen on the ne next verses. What is the application of this principle? 
now to you and me. Here, Paul will explain on the next verses, verse 4. Therefore, because of that analogy, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law, though the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. What does that mean? As believers, we have been made to die to the law, meaning that we do not depend on the law for our salvation. Now take note, it is not the law that died, okay? It, it, it is us who died or should die. It is not the law. What does die to the law mean? It means those who have participated in the death of Christ experience freedom from the law. Therefore, we are no longer under the curse of the law, which is death. You know what? Paul's critique of Jewish practices centers on, on, on Jewish uh, followers of Christ, often called uh, Judaizers, they were called Judaizers, who believe certain Jewish distinctive practices should be requirements also for the Gentiles. That's their problem those times. Okay, the, the Gentiles uh, converse, the Christians. Now, Paul disagrees that those practices, such as circumcision, okay, such as uh, dietary restrictions, you don't eat this, you don't do that, because if you do this, you eat that, you are not righteous, okay? So Paul was disagreeing with them that those should not be requirements for following Christ or for becoming righteous in the sight of God. You know, in the book of Romans, in the book of Galatians, okay, Paul strenuously opposes the idea that righteousness before God can be attained by proper observance of the law. And we all know that those Judaizers at that time, they were so focused on the externals, okay, the external religious practices for sanctification and even for justification. Now, God's standard of sanctification is through Jesus Christ, through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit who is in you. Your moral behavior will now be aligned to the characters of Jesus. That is why we need to die to the curse of the law because the law, if we, if we follow the law, it cannot save us. Remember, we are still guilty. Remember the, the message, guilty or not guilty. Let me put this, this uh, summarize these uh, four verses in order to, to show what Apostle Paul was trying to say here. Here's the analogy, the analogy of marriage, okay? Now, when a wife is bound to marriage law with her husband, the marriage contract, okay? When her husband died, the wife is released from the law with her husband. Okay, so here Paul makes the point that death ends all obligations of that contract, the marriage contract. A wife is no longer bound to her husband if the husband dies, and uh, there is a death of that, that contract as well. Now, what happens if the wife remarries? Wife is no longer guilty of this law here because he was as she was released from that law. That's why he is no longer guilty of breaking the law. That's the analogy, okay? Now let's talk about uh, what Paul was saying with regards to our sanctification. Justification by law, remember? Judaizers, they have this uh, argument that the only way to salvation is you have to obey all the laws to be made right with God. And you also have to follow these practices that we have. If you're not circumcised, you will not be saved, okay? But the problem is no one can obey the law, all of the law. The Bible says, James 2.10, if you obey nine, you stumble at one, you are guilty of all, everything. That's a big problem. We cannot have salvation, and that's the reality, and that is why God made a solution. What was that? Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus' death and resurrection, what happens there? We died to the law, released from the demands of the law to be justified. We are declared not guilty because of Jesus' death 
on the cross and his resurrection. Okay? Remember, the law does not justify us, right? It does not make us right with God, okay? The law does not sanctify us, all right? It does not take us deeper with God and make us more holy before him. Now here, Jesus fulfilled the law. He obeyed all the law, and we have been declared righteous because of his death and resurrection. What is our part? We put our faith in Jesus. And once we put our faith in Jesus, we have now the right standing before God. We are declared not guilty, justified by faith, not justified by law. So here's the analogy. Here's the lesson. Verses 1 to, one to uh, 5 of uh, uh, chapter 7. That's why Paul says here, uh, Therefore, brethren, you also were made, you died to the law, the requirements of the law to be saved. You died to that. Why? Because through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined. The word joined here, it's the same thing with married. Okay? You join an, an, to another, to him, Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. Now, without Christ, you and I are bound to the law. And we cannot be righteous in God's standard by observing the law and righteousness practices. But we have already learned from previous discussions that in, in this series that we are doomed to fail in that relationship if we just follow the law. We can never follow the law perfectly, okay? And we will always be guilty. But now, Paul says we were made to die to the law, okay? So that we may join to Jesus Christ, just like one is set free to enter into a brand new relationship. And that is our relationship with Jesus. You were freed from the law and united to Christ. Here, Jesus Christ is your new husband. That's the picture, the analogy from that marriage contract. There is now a spiritual union, okay? With an all glorious, all powerful all providing, all satisfying, ever living person. That is Jesus Christ, more real than the person sitting next beside you, more than real than your wife, your husband. It's Jesus Christ Himself. And we have been released from the, from the curse of the law, and we are joined to Christ for what purpose? What is the purpose? The aim, the aim of the joining together, okay, the marriage. What? so that we might bear fruit for God. Are you justified by faith? Yes or no? If yes, uh, turn to your neighbor, tell them, bear fruit. Okay, <laughs> bear fruit. All right? That's part of our sanctification process, bearing fruit. John Piper said, you don't go on sinning if you are in Christ, justified and married to your Savior, Jesus, you bear fruit for God. That means that new desires and attitudes and choices and actions grow like fruit from this all-satisfying relationship between you and your living husband, Jesus Christ. Folks, justification brings forth sanctification. If you are truly justified, you will be sanctified you will go through the process of sanctification. That's why we need to examine ourselves every day. If there's no transformation in me, if, if my lifestyle before is lying and lying and lying, after I came to Christ, I'm still lying, lying and lying. And you ask yourself, are you really justified? Am I really justified? How come there's no sanctification process? How come there's no transformation? How come there's no changes? We need to examine ourselves. I cannot judge we cannot judge. It's between you and God, and God, but you need to examine yourself. Let's move on. Verse 5. Therefore, for while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. Here, Apostle Paul is talking about fruit. But now, we have been released from the law. Remember, you died to the law, from the curse of the law, from the requirements of the law for salvation. Having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness of the 
letter. Now, why did we die to the law? Why are we released from the law? Why are we not under the law anymore? Why? So that we may sin all the more? Is that that's the, 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 uh, the, the purpose of dying to the law? Of course not, okay? What's the purpose? So that we serve, okay? Death to the law makes servants, genuine servants of Christ, not sinners, okay? But notice how, what kind of service does freedom from the law produce? Is it a, a legalistic service? Of course not. Verse 6 says, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. If you are justified by faith, okay, you are united to Christ by faith. You are married to him. Now, he is, he is the satisfying love of your life. And you bring forth fruit from fellowship with him. Okay, it's a, an, a byproduct. The fruits are byproduct. Or to put it another way, if you are justified by faith, you are inhabited by the Spirit. The Spirit of Christ, and He is not neutral or passive. All right? He is at work in you to create a newness of mind and heart to love and to serve. Okay? To love and to serve. That's why Galatians 5, 16 to 18 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh, for the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For this, these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The evidence of being released from the curse of the law, justified by faith person, is being led by the Holy Spirit, sanctification, the growth to becoming like Christ. Because it says here, if you are led by the Spirit, if you have the Holy Spirit in you because you have been justified by faith, you are no longer under the law. You are truly, genuinely saved person. You have been justified by faith, not justification under the law, the curse of the law. So you walk by the Spirit, not on the desire of your sinful nature. All right? Continue. Verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Okay, Paul is trying to make an argument here because he was defending to these uh, Judaizers. All right? May it never be. Of course not. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law, for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not Covet. Have you heard from our previous message? I think it was last week or many times from this series that the law is like a mirror. The law is like a mirror. If you look at the mirror, what, what, can, you see, what can you see? Ah, oh, a, 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 a handsome face, right? A beautiful face. But if you can see on your face uh, a dot, a small dot, all right? You cannot see that apart from looking at the mirror. The Bible or the law is like that. It is like a mirror. It's, it's from Romans chapter 3. It says here, Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. You know that you are a sinner if you look at the law. All right? That's why the law is like a mirror. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. And Apostle Paul was saying, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Of course not. The law is not a sin. Okay? But it's, it, Paul says that the law is, is, is the one who is uh, telling me that I am a sinner. But, and he said in verse 8, but sin taking opportunity. The sin is taking opportunity. What does that mean? Like setting up, do we know this word opportunity? It, it is like setting up a base of operation, like in military, okay? For example, in, in a war, you set up a base of operation, okay? That's opportunity, to, to, topo or topography, all right? That's where you, you, you fire your, your missiles, okay? That's your base, all right? all right? So sin here, it's taking the opportunity through the commandment. 
How does that work? Let me give you an example here. Let's say, let's say for example, you are angry at one person. You are angry at one person towards somebody, and you you are really really angry, and it develops to bitterness. You are bitter to that person, and when you open your Bible, okay, when you open your Bible, the Bible says, or maybe you are studying the Bible with your D group, with your D group and D group members, and your counselor or the Bible will say, oh, you know what does the Bible is saying here? What does the Bible says? Forgive as Christ has forgiven you. Now, many times, our immediate reaction inside is at least. <laughs> I'm not ready for this. We can skip this one. Right? Initial reaction because of our sinful nature. Sin taking opportunity through the commandment. We don't like to follow. The sin is taking opportunity in us. The command is to forgive, but our sinful nature, we say, oh, no way. There's no way. Oh, I'm not ready. Oh, there's no way. I did. That person don't deserve forgiveness. All right? The sin is taking opportunity in the, through the commandment. All right? That is our natural sinful reaction. So it produced, Paul is saying, it produced in me coveting of every kind. And apart from the law, sin is dead. Apart from the law, sin is dead. And you know, we will continue, we will jump into the, to the last verses of this uh, segment because in verses 9 to 11, Paul is just uh, supporting these this, uh, verses here. Let's move to verses 12 to 13. Paul is saying, so then, the law is holy. Because he was saying, is the law sin? Of course not. Law is not sin. It is just like a mirror for us to know that we are sinners. Is the law sin? No. So then, the law is holy. And the commandment is holy and righteous and good. However, we, are, we, we died to the requirements of the law for salvation because justification is by faith. Therefore, did that which is good, referring to the law, become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Of course not. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by effecting my death through that which is good so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. Here, Paul praises the law as a good and holy gift from God. The law is good because it will remind us of our sins. Okay? Since it requires what is right from humanity, God wants us to live righteous lives through the law. The practical holiness, okay? Practical righteousness. He rejects any argument that blames the law as the cause of human sin. And in verse 13, the commandment exposed sin as rebellion against God. The law exposed sin as rebellion against God. That's why we need to continue to study the Word of God so that we will know where should we need to grow in our walk to becoming more and more like Jesus. But we do not obey the law that is holy and good to be saved but we obey them because we are saved. We do not follow the law so that we could enter heaven, but because we are assured of heaven, we have been justified by faith. Now we will obey the law. That's the natural response, a life that is continually sanctified through the Holy Spirit. There is a delight, a desire, to obey the law, to obey the word of God because of the Holy Spirit working in us, because we have a new master, we are already joined to Christ. I know many of you, this in the Bible that uh, the church, us, you and I, we are described as what? We are described as the bride of Christ, the bride of Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful picture, all right? We are the bride of Jesus Christ, the bridegroom. Now, Paul's earlier illustration about how death frees a once married person to be joined to another reminds us that in the Bible, you and I are described as the bride of Jesus Christ. We are no longer bound to the law to attain righteousness, to have justification. 
Now we belong to our eternal bridegroom, Jesus Christ. A Christian wedding is such a wonderful uh, portray, uh, portray of how we willingly give ourselves to Jesus Christ because we are married to Jesus Christ. Look at this verse in Revelation 19, 7 to 8. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, to Jesus, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Who are the saints? You and I, we are the saints. We prove our love and faithfulness to our Lord and bridegroom through righteousness, sanctified, holy life. So what should be our mindset as people bound to Christ, as people married to Christ? We have been released from the curse of the law. We are not justified by the law, but we are justified by faith through Jesus Christ. And we are now joined or, or, or been married to Jesus Christ. Transfer, all right? The transfer of ownership, our master is Jesus Christ. Now, what, does, what, uh, what is our application for this part? What should be the mindset of one joined to Christ as Lord? Ask ourselves. You ask yourself, how can I keep myself faithful and pure in mind and body? I am joined to Christ. How can I keep myself faithful to him? Like husband and wife, you are faithful to each other. How can I be faithful to Jesus in everything that I have, in my mind, in my heart, in my thoughts, in my words? What can I do to please my Lord? Like marriage, you ask your, your, your husband, you ask your wife, how can I do something to please you? Now in a relationship with Jesus, how can I please Jesus in my life? How can I honor him always in my words and actions. How can I honor him? Remember, one way we can honor Jesus as our bridegroom is to tell other people about him. We could honor God, we could honor Jesus if we tell other people about Jesus. That's why this book, the, the book of Romans, is about the righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus imputed to us and a life living in righteousness, a life representing Jesus Christ and a life that is continually spreading the good news of salvation, the gospel message of salvation to all the people that needs Jesus to be their bridegroom because not everyone is a bride of Christ, only to those who are justified by faith. So what's our message for today? There's true freedom in Jesus Christ because he is now our new master. But the thing is, we have to realize that he is our new master. Don't be ignorant, okay? We need to know that in Christ there is freedom. And the key principle behind experiencing true freedom is recognizing that he is our master. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for reminding us, Lord, that once we were slave to sin, and because of your love, because of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for us, we have been set free from the bondage of sin, from the guilt and penalty of sin. We have been set free and released from the curse of the law because we cannot obey the law. Thank you, O oh God, for justifying us when we put our faith to your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that we are now free from sin and slave to righteousness. Our new master is Jesus Christ. And Lord, knowing that in you we have true freedom, knowing that following Jesus Christ as our master is real freedom. Oh God, help us 
to follow you every day, whatever you want us to do. Because you are our master and you called us, Lord, to be sanctified, to be holy, to be righteous in every area of our lives. And Lord, we cannot do it on ourselves, so God, we need the empowerment of your Holy Spirit who is in us. Lord, continue to humble us before you that we will yield to the leading of your Holy Spirit, O God. Search our hearts, Father. Examine us always, O God, if there is anything in us, Lord, any sin that we need to give up so that we will continually live a righteous life. And Lord, thank you. Thank you for that freedom. And because of that, Father, we will serve you. We will love you. We will serve your people. We will love your people. We will serve our family, our spiritual family, and the family members of God in this church and in the body of Christ as a whole. Lord, we cannot just thank you enough, O oh God, for what you have done in us. Lord, we just want to offer our lives to you because you deserve, you deserve all of this, Father, living our lives in holiness. And Lord, as we depart from this place today, as we will have our fellowship, I pray, Father, that we will continue to realize that you are our master. That in everything that we do, in everything that we say, oh God, we will continue to be intentional in growing and representing and presenting ourselves, our body, to righteousness. Lord, may you bless the rest of our time today. May you be magnified. May you be glorified. All the glory, all the honor unto your name. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And